Welcome, folks. Hi, Jeffrey. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kaylee. Give it a few minutes for people to trickle in and probably get started at 5 app. So while we're waiting for more people to trickle in, if anybody would like to add anything to the agenda, please go ahead and do so. Okay, um, if everybody's cool, let's go ahead and get started. Just a reminder, um, these meetings are recorded. Uh, so if you ever wanna go back and rewatch something, you can. And then additionally, you know, try to keep our um, conversation civil and clean. Um, so KubeCon just passed, I apologize, Taylor and I. Um, we took Monday, last Monday off, so we missed some stuff. I know there was some security discussions. I don't know um, for anybody who was here last week. Did you guys kind of do like a recap? Any like solid sessions that like the group should go back and watch? Maybe not CNF specific, but things that might like relate to our field around like the security space or the networking and plumbing space or anything like that. We can put together a list if um, if that helps. I don't think anyone's gathered the list just yet because uh, the YouTube videos or the recordings are not uh, are not released yet. 
Sure. And if anybody like Vintage and Live, I just, this was really just a chance for someone to like speak and be like, oh, this was really cool. I think the group should look at this. And then I think Frederick would be a great idea to your suggestion, Adam. Once all the videos are uploaded and available, maybe we just kind of put like a little miniature library together of um, things that we should like look into. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, so we did have, oh, Looks like Taylor's got a cool list here. So we'll go back and look at those. Maybe, um, you know, we'd like to discuss some of the things that came out in them. Um, I know there was like the maintainer track. We had a couple people. people. Um, one thing we might want to consider too is, um, you know, the maintainer track was of course on the last day um, <laughs> about dinner time. So um, we did get a lot of people from the Asia Pacific region that showed up to the call um, or the presentation. So. One thing we might want to consider too is um, obviously we've had a very, you know, Western Europe, North American friendly time. Um, we might want to consider in the future how we get some of our friends in Australia, New Zealand, China, um, Korea, et cetera, India, um, more involved. Um, so Taylor's put that list up. We can add links later once they become available. And if anybody wants to go back to the notes and add some sessions that they think were awesome, please do. Um, I don't know if anybody's got some topics they want to dive into too that I kind of want to look into. I don't know, Frederick, if there's anything from last week that we need to continue to double tap on. And I see that um, Randy's on here, but um, I was actually thinking um, now that we're kind of past most of the administrative stuff, we've been talking around best practices. Um, I do think working asynchronously will help us and we can start fleshing some stuff out. But um, I think another topic that would be really good to look into is. Um, Randy had started this discussion around um, dealing with NAT and BGP. So BGP is a fact of life, obviously, in the CNF space, and NAT is everywhere. So it might be something um, I thought would be like a good discussion post KubeCon to start like digging into alongside some of the least pract or least um, least privileged security best practices, et cetera. And so if anybody else wants to potentially add new topics or say, let's look somewhere else, then by all means, please speak up. Yeah, on, on the security part, I'm I'm going to put together some, um, or I'm gonna do a little bit of writing to discuss uh, the software bill of materials and uh, with the, some of the stuff that's going on there and uh, how we can start to uh, put recommendations towards people uh, building towards it. Uh, this is it's still a very early space, so the tools there are, are very are very immature. But there's a lot of work that's going to that's going to be put into that particular space because uh, one of the requirements they're sticking in the U.S. government is that critical infrastructure also follow uh, also follow the guideline uh, or follow the requirement, I should say. And uh, the question then becomes how, how long will telecom be considered to be or service provider be considered to be critical infrastructure? Uh, and if so, when will it be considered? So they may not give, they may not initially define it, but they may expand it over time. So in short, uh, what defining for people or describing for people what it is and where things are, are heading, even if there's nothing concrete that they can do uh, right now because of the maturity level it, it's still useful for people to to know what's what's coming down the pipeline so uh, i have some stuff i'm going to write on that um, and i'll i'll put it inside of a pull request later on cool and um i was looking at last week's notes um so yeah the signing and verification of signatures um is this eventually going to lead in like I know I've talked to Taylor about this. We had some discussions about air gapped installations, private repositories, et cetera. Um, this is actually a topic I've been looking at internally myself recently is this notion of um, signed images and you know, creating um, trusted repos, only allowing things to deploy into production that are signed, et cetera, which um, I feel like one of the like, you know, things about um, cloud native and like, you know, faster and more agile software releases is sometimes we play things a little fast and loose. and um, the need to go fast sometimes outweighs our need to be safe. Um, so I'm just curious too, Frederick, if that's going to be involved in this. Um, I know it's something near and dear to my heart is, you know, if I'm working with, you know, vendors one, two, and three, um, like how are we creating that secure supply chain between them in the microservices and CI space? 
Yeah, it's it's part of it, but it go, excuse me, it goes a bit deeper than that. So um, it's actually looking at not just what's the signed image, but looks at the contents and tries to work out what's within those signed images um, and and does so recursively throughout uh, throughout the vendors. And part of the idea is that let's say that someone pulls in a, a library that uh, that has a vulnerability in it and they compile it in. Uh, statically, so your 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 images don't pick it up. Then, you, because it's in the software bill of materials, then you you still have visibility into the fact that this thing was pulled into your system, and ends up uh, giving you giving you the ability to rely on uh, on tooling that has information from the source, as opposed to relying on image scanners to try to pick it up, uh, and so. It's, it's part of it is trying to move the bar uh, is trying to move the bar uh, further to the left in the build system. But the other part on it, uh, which is where I think the, the real benefit is if, if we can pull this off properly as a, as a, an industry is going to be around the additional tooling we get, which allows us to determine what's in our infrastructure because a large problem that I've seen on on major enterprises is that many many major enterprises have no idea of where things come from or what's running. Somebody leaves the company. The, their servers there that they're not sure if they can shut them down or not because they might be doing something important. And this will help give them some of that visibility as well into by by maturing the entire tool chain. So a lot of people will hyper focus on the SVOM itself, which does provide some utility, but I think the real utility is going to be around the tooling that uh, that generates around it. Cool. Okay. Anything else that we want to touch on in this space? I just put this up here in case there was anything that didn't get finished last week. I wasn't here, so I'm not sure where you guys ended. Because if not, um, Rainy, I don't know if you'd let me put you on the spot or not, but I was wondering if we could potentially talk about this discussion you started. Um, if you wouldn't mind, you know, potentially giving us a little overview and we could kind of talk them. Um, this is something I know specifically as a service provider is near and dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, I feel it's like been, there's probably multiple ways to address it, so. Yeah, it's been a while, as you can see, February, it's like nine months ago. Uh, not sure I remember what triggered it, but anyway, I think the, uh, just uh, there was some discussion that reminded me of some similar issues back in the days from the SIP and voice over IP days, I think. Some of the concept might be applicable here. Uh, basically, it's the idea of um, a network function running in a cluster and the local IP address of that the container sees or at its end of the uh, IP socket may not be the actual public IP address. And there needs to be a way for the network function to know what is the externally routable IP address so it can advertise it in something like a BGP. Um, so there are several techniques out there. I mentioned a few of them. I don't know how uh, prevalent they are these days, but uh, stun and turn used to be popular like 10 years ago. Um, so something like that may be uh, used as a best practice for a network function like a router to discover its externally routable IP address and uh, use this in the, um, in the application protocol, in this case, uh, BGP. Sorry, I'm just really quick reading through, um, you know, if anybody else wants to chime in, I know Ian and I have talked about this one a lot. Um, and I think this one is interesting, like just the concept of putting a route reflector in containers inside of Kubernetes, you know, it's not as straightforward as you would think it would be. Um, 
and specifically for the like issues that Randy just mentioned. Everyone's quiet this morning. I always talk a lot. I mean, so some of the things that we can look at, right, is obviously there's um, some of the things here. You've got the any other ideas. Um, I know, too, there could be, this is always the dangerous one, but CNI based approaches, right? So, I mean, you have um, certain CNIs that do have BGP speakers, bundles in with them, and you can directly advertise pod space. So then theoretically, um, you can go and host your services in a pod that has an IP address that is advertised and therefore is the source address versus natting through the host address. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got any thoughts on this. Um, I'm also curious too, like I've done limited stuff with this, but if anybody's got an experience like, um, you know, the notion of uh, putting lots and lots of these, you know, endpoints out there in BGP, um, best practices around where you set your aggregates, et cetera, so that you don't constantly have a bunch of um, entries being added and withdrawn, you know, as pods spin themselves up and spin themselves down. Um, I think there's probably even just in a generic context as more and more people look at peering with their underlay with both Calico or Cilium. We could put out some best practices um, or work with the network plumbing group because I think this would probably be within their um, space as well. But like, how do you sit there and properly, you know, look at this from like a large scale network perspective with BGP as far as how and where to advertise. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on that, it, but um, it's something where like I've seen where we've done like limited context and stuff, but like the way that we handle our route tables in some cases are quite massive and having tons and tons of pods come up and come down is not something we want. So we, you know, basically set like, uh, we use eBGP a lot more than um, iBGP for instances like this to make sure that we're like protecting the bigger route tables. This is a bit of a connection storm issue, basically. You know, you either do it in okay. the Kubernetes control plane or you try to do it in the networking control plane, like you were handling lots of equipment out there. I'm guessing since it is services, they're going to be spun up together with you know the containers. Yeah. This is the tricky stuff from hell. <laughs> Apparently, Helium has support for BGP. Um, or I haven't read this, uh, this article, but I mentioned the BGP support there. So are the options then to either say that you have a separate service for setting it up, or you try to do it in the, let's call it the Kubernetes control plane, or you try to do it in the networking control planes. Are those the three options, or is there a fourth one that we just haven't considered? I mean, with the four to three option, and, and and the one that I've seen used the most basically is uh, is not necessarily advertising this pod space, but rather to bring a, a specific interface to to the pod being that route reflector and and leverage uh, you know like like was mentioned you know CNI based approach so you could have multiple interfaces and attach a specific pod. We have a specific load interface. another service with the specific interface that does that, and then it sets up the rest of the network from there. Exactly. So you wouldn't necessarily touch or do anything uh, regarding the, the 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 pod service itself or the Kubernetes layer. You just bypass it completely by adding an external interface to it. Yeah. One thing I just kind of wanted to mention on that topic, since you know we run into some of these issues when we're talking about the Kubernetes interfaces, of course, that, you know, everyone now seems to be talking talking smart mix of one way or another. So even if you're using CNI and Cilium and whatever happens, 
the offload of larger and larger pieces to the these kind of smart things coming in will probably be the next step for a lot of mentality use cases just for you know cost reasons mainly uh, i think i misunderstand something is the goal to have uh, the cni handling bgp or is the goal to have within the cluster an application or a pod that is say a route reflector and and the application or the pod itself is you know handling the bgp traffic exactly because so then we're right. getting into that point that well, then we're doing packet processing on on a on a cpu again so um that was I'm trying to like catch up with all these notes. Um, the uh, so one, I think we're just like spitballing here and coming out with discussions, right? So for one, um, the Smartnik thing is a completely tangential thing. I would say that um, that side, like I was just mentioning CNIs because this specific topic right here is around NAT, right? Um, and so really just um, BGP. We should probably start a discussion around just like BGP best practices, which would I think fall into like the security or at least privileges kind of like top level domain where then you would have lots and lots of subdomains that we could tease out. Um, so like a CNI is just one way to do it, right? Because you can basically get away from natting by directly advertising pod space, but there's definitely some pitfalls into that, um, especially around some of the discussions that were just managed on, uh, you know, who is managing the control plane at that point? Are we having the CNI talk to something? Are we going to have some kind of plug-in? Um, you know, I mean, the SDN battle has been waging for quite a long time, um, you know, oh. between clouds, third-party controllers. Uh, once we start mapping this into our underlay, right? Well, like, um, like I said, we've done limited stuff where like we'll peer um, like specific clusters, like a limited set of pod space so we can, you know, advertise like cluster IPs, et cetera. But like, Doing this at scale, like starting to like really like populate this into like, you know, your global routing tables to where I want service X to just be like finding findable within my network and stuff. I mean, there's much, much bigger impl impl implications. Pardon me, I can't talk this morning. I haven't had enough coffee. But um, around like, you know, what does it mean? I mean, the whole concept of BGP and why it's popular is because it's stable and it has this notion of convergence, right? Like, so what does that look like if something is constantly churning? And I mean, it's doable, right? We see this with like, you know, VXLAN and EVPN implementations and routing by MAC address, et cetera. But like, um, I feel like there's definitely like best practices that are super relevant to the CNF space, especially when we start talking about putting, um, I mean, I can just, you know, we're getting like vendors coming to us with, you know, cloud native, quote unquote, cloud native, like um, BNGs, broadband routers, you know, obviously the packet core is the 800 pound gorilla that everybody wants to solve, especially the user plane side of it. Um, so, I would say, you know, SmartNix would be one path where we might do this, and then um, we let the SmartNix handle this, and we pass that through into a pod. There's the concept of I'm going to put something that needs to understand and speak BGP within the pod, so then how do I handle the NAT issue, which is what Randy has up here. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that we could tease out in the space. I would like to capture what we'd like to have in the future, even if it's not, doesn't look possible now versus what we can do today. So the, in the original discussion post, Rennie had listed the application querying the orchestra, orchestrator about the assigned IPs. So it's that one seems more like dynamic services and treating this whole thing that way. And I, there's probably other areas that that could expand on, like being able to use the smart next and anything else that comes up. So an ideal situation, what would that look like? 
and saying, here is how we would, we, we would love to be able to describe our services this way, the BGP, and it, here's how it would work. And some of it may not be there, but if we could say, you know, eight out of 10 or six out of 10 pieces are, are ready, but these four critical ones aren't, then we can go and actually share that directly with um, like the Kubernetes plumbing working group and SIG network and everyone else and start pushing that forward while we also work on what, what can we do in the meantime um, solutions. It seems like if you're going to have have if you're not going to directly attach interfaces to a pod that has that's doing handling the BGP and maybe even you're using in some way of directly attaching that pod to a smart NIC that's off you know, where you're offloading stuff, then you're going to have end up with some type of PGP, BGP that's broken down further into components where you're needing some service level. I don't know if that means an operator or if there's something else that's more generic that's expanding on the current capabilities for having IPs assigned to services, which you can do, but it doesn't seem like that's handling everything needed right now. So potentially we're getting into that service chain where the service connects to an interface that then does the BGP and then whatever it runs that on, if it's CNI or the SmartNIC or whatever. Well, I, I want us to like keep the, um, sorry, I was talking in the mute, um, trying to answer you, Taylor. Like there's definitely some like lines of responsibility. So when we talk about attaching an interface, right? Like if we pass a SmartNIC into a pod, then we're giving it the physical interface versus, you know, a tap interface, et cetera. But like, I think what we're really discussing here and please correct me if I'm like not thinking about this right is really the provisioning of said interfaces, the provisioning of said services. Like what are the lines of demarcation between, you know, potentially Kate's um, in a generic CNI like type of exposure, something where we're actually passing forward, sorry, passing through some type of physical interface to a pod that's then like offloading some of this capability so we're not actually doing that packet processing in the pod itself and then like what the relationship between the kubernetes control plane versus the rest of the network control plane looks like right but i mean i think we got to be careful saying that like if we use a smart name that we're not like attaching an interface because you know we still like how we attach that smart nick to the pod it's either going to be some type of direct pass through or it's going to be through a cni right like using, I don't know, like Multis and the SRV, um, uh, sub CNI, et cetera, right? So I, I, it sounds like setup. what we're really talking about is, say that again? Yeah, it needs a similar setup, you know, even right. if you're using different components to end, reach the same end result, you know, what you want to do is that you want to make it easy to set it up. Yeah, this is how you can connect it. Right. Because at the end of the day, right, we, we have an interface to a pod that, like, exposes it to the rest of the network, right? Like, that doesn't go away. There's just a lot of ugly ways to do that right now and exploring the best way. And BGP, because it's very finicky, happens to have some strong opinions on how you should do that. So then that's when we have to start figuring out, like, do we just put smart NICs everywhere and use node labels and just say, you know, this is... A Nick that's going to make this a lot easier. Um, it's going to handle all of the BGP, you know, negotiations here. 
on this discrete chip on the NIC, and then it's going to have an interface that passes through directly to the pod, and all the pod does is, you know, offload traffic to it. Or, um, I mean, I feel like there's not going to be one like winner takes all too, right? Because there's going to be CNF developers who are going to develop software that does packet processing in pods that is ultimately going to need to be able to then talk to the rest of the network, um, which I think that's probably one of the, like, things that have been like hotly debated since Multis and everybody first showed up on the scene, right? Um, but yeah, and the Thelium stuff, you know, it works really good for quite a lot of traffic. You know, we've been playing around with it and, you know, seems to be working, but but the key is, you know, how much traffic are you actually pushing through it or not? I think one convenient thing about this use case too versus some of the other ones is um, since this is a control plane exercise too, we don't have to get super far into the weeds around um, data plane acceleration, et cetera, right? Like this is specifically around understanding how to basically advertise routes, withdraw routes and do this within a potentially natted and containerized world. So I, I would like to just call out that um, while I know at some point this BGP speaker would probably be attached to some type of data plane <laughs> as well that we would then have those things. So like we don't necessarily need to solve SIRV and you know fast packet performance in a pod for just pure BGP. I think if um, no one else has any topics they specifically want to discuss right now, um, I'm going to start putting in some PRs. I've been kind of like slammed with work and getting past the conferences, but um, have some things to discuss. And I know Frederick said he's going to do a write up, but um, is there any other topics that anybody would like to add to this, today's discussion? Okay, then um, we'll give everybody 25 minutes back. Um, oops, that's stuff in chat. Is it just the meeting notes? Excellent. Okay, um, we will chat with everybody next Monday then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. See you. Bye. Bye.
Thanks all. Good day.